moment. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. It's an honor and a privilege to have my guest today, who was my personal physician when I lived in Los Angeles, a plant-based doctor, Dr. Roy Artal, who is a triple threat because he is board certified not only in internal medicine, but in pulmonary medicine and sleep medicine. And today we are gonna be talking Sleep 101. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Roy Artal. You're one of the few things I miss about LA. <laughs> Thanks, AJ. It's always, always amazing to see you. And every time I see you, I just, I just want to thank you for everything that you do for, for, for this movement and for getting people to be healthy and eat healthy and do the right thing. So oh. thank you again. <laughs> Well, that's, that's why I'm here. I got nothing else to do for my remaining days, however long they will be. You know, when I knew you, I just thought, God, because you had a, a fourth certification. At one point, you were also board certified in critical care. And I thought, wow, he's just a real smarty pants. But then I'm noticing that when doctors are board certified in multi-specialties, it's almost like a cluster that sleep and pulmonary and critical care, they, they seem to go together. Why is that? Sure. So, so after medical school, you, you do a residency in internal medicine, if you're interested in kind of internal medicine, um, organ system type, type medicine. And then after that, if, if you choose to specialize in a specific field, whether it's cardiology or gastroenterology or pulmonary medicine, which is, which is diseases of the lungs, you have an opportunity to do extra training and it's called fellowship training post-residency. And oftentimes, pulmonary medicine and ICU medicine are clustered together because there's so much overlap between the two because a lot of pulmonary medicine does take place in intensive care units. So, so those two are sort of natural clusters. And a lot of um, uh, physicians who are board certified in sleep medicine who get trained in sleep medicine also come from that background because the most common disorder of sleep that people go to the doctor for is obstructive sleep apnea, which is a disorder of breathing. So it just so happens that a lot of pulmonary doctors also get trained and practice in, in the, in the um, field of sleep medicine, like I do. And the, the cool thing about sleep medicine is there's also a lot of neat things about sleep medicine that have nothing to do with breathing and nothing to do with the lungs. I mean, there's some neurology and there's some psychiatry and there's some pediatrics and a lot of behavioral stuff. So, you know, it gives me a chance to spread my wings and do some things that I don't, don't necessarily do day to day. Well, I would imagine with COVID, pulmonary and critical care, they're kind of intertwined right now. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been an interesting year. What can I say? But hopefully, you know, people are, um, you know, hopefully the light at the end of the tunnel, people are getting vaccinated. I definitely encourage everybody to get, to get vaccinated, um, protect yourself and protect your loved ones. And um, hopefully, hopefully we'll get through this. And, you know, I'm, I'm really interested to see what permanent societal changes will exist after the pandemic. I mean, are we gonna kind of go back to shaking hands? Are we gonna go back to kind of hugging as greetings? So, I mean, there's all these sort of subtle little social things that, have, that, we've, that we've always done, but now people are gonna be like, wait, I mean, do I hug? Do I not hug? Do I shake hands? Right? So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that kind of plays out over the years. It, it will be. Um, so when it comes to sleep, it doesn't seem like it's something that's ever been emphasized, at least it, not to any doctor that I've gone to. You know, there are doctors that are like, yeah, eat right, exercise, but nobody ever tells you sleep right. Yeah, I mean, sleep is sleep medicine, sleep disorders have always been kind of the um, little bit of the forgotten child of medicine. And, you know, it's, it's really a very new discipline. I mean, it's really a discipline that has really emerged in the last 30, 40 years, which, which is really infancy compared to, compared to um, other, branches of, other branches of medicine. But it's, it's super important, right? And we spend at least a third of our lives sleeping. Um, that accounts for a lot. Sleep is not just our brain shutting down. Sleep is an active neurologic process in which important bodily functions take place, both in the brain as well as the rest of our bodies during sleep. And if, if we don't respect that, if we don't give our bodies sufficient opportunity to sleep, if we don't give our bodies um, a sufficient opportunity to get not just sleep, but good quality sleep, high quality sleep, um, we don't do well, we don't feel well. And, and all of us know the difference between how we feel when we wake up and we've gotten a great night's sleep and we kind of 
stretch our arms and, and, and we feel like we can conquer the world. And, and, you know, and unfortunately those other nights where we wake up feeling kind of tired and with a headache and having not gotten a good night's sleep. So all of us, all of us know that, that feeling. And it's, it's, it's important to try to try to maximize sleep and, 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 and respect it, as I said. We'd get a lot more done if we didn't need to sleep. We sure would. You know, sleep is a funny thing. You know, it's 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 a um, from from an evolutionary standpoint, a lot of people kind of scratch their heads at it. I mean, it's a it's a period of uh, it's a period of your life where you're exposed to predators, where uh, something bad can happen to you. You're not aware of your surroundings. Um, uh, you know, you're you're not out hunting and gathering and and, and growing food and, and and looking for nourishment. So you know, it's a it, it's a um, it, it's an interesting evolutionary question. A lot of people are looking at it and thinking about it and studying it. Does every species sleep? Every species sleeps. Wow, that's interesting. And how, how do we know if we are getting adequate sleep? Is it is it because we feel refreshed when we wake up, or is there like a self test that we can take to see if we are getting? Because I know there's different phases of sleep, and sometimes it's not necessarily how long you sleep, but whether you're entering these the deep phases. Sure. Yeah. No. Great questions. Um, you know, I think when, when I'm seeing patients, um, um, not necessarily for sleep, but, but some of my general medicine patients, I'll just ask them, hey, how do you sleep? Are you rested in the morning? Do you feel like you have good energy during the day? You know, and if, if the answer to all those is yes, then, you know, they're, they're probably okay, right? But I mean, I mean, those are really, really easy screening questions that everybody can ask themselves, right? Everybody who's watching this, this, this show, hey, you know, how do I feel about my sleep? When I wake up in the morning, am I refreshed? Do I feel good? I mean, waking up with a headache. I mean, waking up with a sore throat. Do I have good energy and am I able to stay wakeful throughout the day, right? So those are all questions that we can ask ourselves. And if, if we're not so sure on the answers or not too enthusiastic that maybe things are going the way we want them to, then maybe, you know, maybe you have to do a little bit of digging, a little bit of exploring. Yeah. Well, so many people rely on things like coffee as a stimulant to wake up in the morning. And if you need coffee, isn't that a sign that you aren't getting adequate sleep? You know, I, I think there's a difference between need and want and, um, you know, and addiction, right? So, I mean, you, you know, it, a, a lot of people, it, it, it's cultural, it becomes ingrained that they're gonna wake up and have the morning um, cup of coffee or tea. So I, you know, I, I don't think having a morning caffeinated beverage necessarily signifies that there's a problem. Where I become concerned is when people use caffeine to medicate themselves. And, and you people know who you are, right? I mean, I mean, these are people who will, you know, well, it's, it's been two hours since my last drink, so I have to take my shot of espresso, or it's time, for my, it's time for my energy drink, or it's time for my caffeine pill. I mean, we're, we're not just talking about the occasional, about kind of the everyday person who will, who will drink a cup of coffee or tea in the morning to just kind of get going. We're talking about people who really use this as a way to medicate themselves throughout the day. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Well, I mean, I, our ancestors, did they even drink coffee and tea? Because everything now is about drinking green tea for prevention of cancer and Alzheimer's. And I'm trying to think, how did they do that in the Stone Age? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm going to say this, that's a good question. I don't know when, um, uh, I, I would think that the tea is has been around longer than coffee, but I, I, I could be, you know, I shouldn't even answer because I, I don't know the answer. But um, you know, it's, it's, it's been around, they've both been around for a while. Um, caffeine exerts a, 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 a pharmacologic effect. Um, caffeine antagonizes the adenosine receptor in the brain. And adenosine is a molecule that accumulates during periods of wakefulness. And one of the theories about sleep is that the more adenosine you have in your brain, the sleepier you become. And caffeine essentially antagonizes or reverses that a little bit. But, you know, the, the, the problem with caffeine is that it has a very long half-life. So it's, it's kind of like the gift that keeps giving. You know, you, you, tr you drink that cup of, of coffee or tea or whatnot in the morning, and it's still going to have an after effect hours later. And studies looking at, at, at volunteers who drank a caffeinated beverage at 8 a.m., doing sleep studies on them the next night, had significantly more disrupted sleep and poorer sleep architecture that night compared to controls when, when they went through the same process without drinking that 8 a.m. morning cup of coffee or tea or whatever. Most people think, hey, if I drink something at 8 a.m., I've got no problem when I go to bed that night, right? But, you know, think again. 
Yeah, well, they don't know until they actually get off. The, and, and the fact that it is a highly addictive drug, but people, you know, people want good news about their bad habits. So <laughs> JC says, well, what about decaf? Doesn't decaf still have about 25% caffeine in it? Yeah, you know, so, so decaffeinated beverages still have some amount of caffeine. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's not caffeine free. It's just low caffeine. So if you're, if you're a tea person like me, then make friends with um, some herbal teas, with some caffeine yeah. free teas. Well, I was pleased to know that they now actually, if it's true that there is something we need in green tea for Alzheimer's prevention or cancer prevention, they are making a decaffeinated version now. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had decaffeinated blends of green tea in our house for, for years and years, and that's primarily what I'll drink. Um, so I, 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 do, I do enjoy my green tea, but it's, it's usually decaf. Nice. And then a lot of people rely on alcohol to go to sleep, but I don't think that's the best thing for sleep, is it? Yeah, I mean, alcohol is not the friend of sleep. Um, you know, and again, study after study has kind of shown disruptions in sleep architecture, um, uh, what's called sleep maintenance insomnia which you're, you're able to fall asleep relatively easily, but you're not able to maintain sleep. So you have awakenings the second half of the night. So um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I would definitely not recommend alcohol as a, as a solution for insomnia. In fact, it'll be the opposite effect. Right, well, a lot of people are doing both, coffee, coffee in the morning, wine at night. Coffee in the morning, wine at night, yeah. Yeah, I, I call it the Judy Garland syndrome. They are upper in the morning, downer in the evening. <laughs> Oh, I'm just thankful I'm not into either of those things. I, 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 how important is a bed to sleep? Because I'm in love with my bed, if that's possible. My husband and I've been married 26 years and 25 of them, we got like the best bed that we could. And like, that's why when we go away, it's like, we, it's like, we just miss our bed so much. Yeah, no, I mean, um, uh, everything in the bedroom is important, right? I mean, temperature is important, right? So bedrooms are supposed to be cool. And, and this has been studied. I mean, this is, people have actually done sleep studies and experiments on subjects and, and setting various bedroom temperatures and, and looking to see sort of what temperatures are associated with kind of optimal sleep quality. So mid to high 60s, mid 60s is probably the optimal, um, optimal bedroom temperature setting. You want to have comfortable bedding, right? You, you, you want something that'll breathe. You want something that's not going to retain moisture so your skin can breathe. We're kind of getting into the summer. It's getting hot, right? So I like to leave my windows open at night, like to have a nice breeze, like to make sure that, that, that any moisture that kind of accumulates in the bedroom and in the bedding gets, gets swept away. So bedding that breathes is super important. Um, having a mattress that fits your body correctly is very important. You know, I've, I've talked to mattresses so many times. I, I kind of feel like, um, you know, I, I could go into mattress sales part-time maybe, but you know, if you're a, if you're a uh, stomach sleeper, you need something a little bit firmer so that you don't kind of invert your back into your bed. Um, if you sleep on your side, you need something a little bit softer, right? So, so you're not going to get pressure points on your shoulders and hips and so forth. So, you, know, you, you have to have a bed that fits your, um, that fits your sleep type, um, um, meaning the way that you sleep, the position that you like to sleep. So yeah, you know, ha having a bed is important. I, th I think we're lucky because I think there's never been more choices um, than ever before in terms of ordering beds and getting beds and ordering them online and in-person stores and, and all of that. So yeah, beds are important. We sleep on a waterbed. People laugh, but man, it's so comfortable. Do you like it? I love it. And it's not one of those old fashioned ones where if one person lays down, the other one flies out. They do baffles now. So it doesn't move very much, you know? Yeah. So I, I sleep in a bed that has baffles, but instead of water, it's, it's, um, it's supported by air. So there, there's an air pump, which is mounted under the bed, which is constantly equilibrating the air within, within the baffles of the bed. And I love it. It's super soft. And, you know, I can program my side the way I like it. My wife can program her side the way she likes it and everybody's happy. Boy, but 60, Dr. Artal, I mean, I, I hate to tell you what we, we keep our house at 80 summer or winter. I mean, that's just... Kind 80. Of. Wow. And, and, and you guys like that? Well, yeah. I mean, when we, well, you know, when you live in the desert, 80 is pretty cool. actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you guys are happy, that's the important thing. Yeah. So. Well, we do sweat a little bit at night, but you know, the thing, the problem I see a lot of people have in, on the chat and, and just people I hear from, especially as they get older is people don't seem to have a lot of trouble falling asleep, but they have trouble staying asleep. And sometimes it's because as they get older, they have to go to the bathroom. But wh why does it seem to be for many people, the staying asleep part is harder than the falling asleep part? 
yeah, big, you know, big problem. Um, big problem for a lot of people. Um, the the longer we sleep, the more we pay off our sleep debt, right? D E B T. So when when you've been awake a certain amount of time, you you've accumulated sleep debt. So you're tired, and it's relatively easy to fall asleep. But after you've slept a certain number of hours, you've paid off some of that sleep debt, and the so-called pressure to sleep is not as high; it's lower. So you know, when when you wake up um, to go to the bathroom, to use the restroom, um, and it's time to go back to bed, uh, it, it it may be not for everybody, but it may be a little bit harder to go back to sleep. Um, you know, and if if you're somebody who is prone to worry, or if you kind of ruminate on things, or, or, or you kind of get up to use the restroom in the middle of the night, and then you start thinking about that work situation, or or that email that you need to answer, or you know, the mortgage, or you know, any of any of the million stuff in our world that that, that, that gives us stress, it's very easy for people to kind of get into a, a bad habit where they kind of focus on those negative things, and that's why it's it's so important. Um, there's, there's so much psychology of, of sleep and insomnia that it's, it's, it's um, I, th I think really important that people have a real um, practice around sleep and, and what they allow themselves to do in, in bed and in the bedroom and what they allow themselves to think about and um, to really have kind of a mindfulness practice surrounding sleep. Yeah. Is there a best position to sleep in a side? I mean, because I, you know, it's funny because different doctors say different things for different conditions. Like for instance, if somebody has sleep apnea, if sure. like the dermatologist mm -hmm. said like, you know, for wrinkles, I, I think it was, you're not supposed to sleep on your side, but I, is there, or just however you're comfortable? You know, I, I would, I would say however you're comfortable. Um, you know, uh, I think everybody is a little bit different, obviously, in terms of orthopedic considerations. Some people have back issues, neck issues, shoulder, hips, right? So from, from, a, from a breathing standpoint, from a, when, when I put on my sleep apnea doctor hat for a moment and people ask me that question, I would generally say, well, sleeping on your side is probably the safest because it, it secures your airway. It helps your airway be more open and you're going to, not everybody, but a lot of people will tend to have less sleep apnea and snoring on their sides, um, but not everybody can sleep on their side, right? I mean, if they've got spine issues, if they've got the shoulder that they can't um, lay on, if they have a hip that they can't lay on, right? So there's, there's all these sort of medical orthopedic considerations for everybody. So I think, I think the right answer is whatever feels best and most comfortable for you. Okay, great. Uh, Apple says, does Dr. Artal have an opinion on pets in the bed? Not that I'm going to kick them out, <laughs> LOL. You know, I, I gave a, um, it's funny, I, I gave a lecture a few months ago, I, I should have uh, included it here, um, on, on sleep hygiene. And, and um, I, I had a, a, a section directly on, on pets um, in the bed, and I, I found a picture online of um, somebody sleeping that I think he had something like five large Great Danes lying on the bed with him in, in this bed. And it was, it was so funny and so hysterical because I'm a dog lover. And, and when, when I had kids, when, when I had dogs growing up, they were always in my bed. But yeah, look, I mean, the, the, the reality is, is that anything that's disrupting your bed, anything, anything or anyone who's moving in your bed is going to be interrupting your sleep. So, you know, I, I think, my, my general advice would be, unless it's a very small, well-behaved dog or cat or something that'll really just kind of occupy a small corner, uh, probably best to get them their own bed. <laughs> Sorry. I know a lot of people love sleeping with their, with, with, with their pets and I was one of them, but um, you know, I'm all about sleep now, so. Right. I don't know if people know, I said at the beginning that you were my doctor, mm -hmm. that you're plant-based. Before we get into more questions about sleep, could you tell a little bit about your story about how you even found out about the plant-based diet and how is that being at Cedar sinai I, I imagine there's probably more plant-based doctors now than when you first became plant-based. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely, I mean, just the term plant-based has become so much more mainstream I and mean, I've been plant-based for about a decade. And, you know, wow, I mean, I, I remember just, you know, in, in the beginning people didn't, most people hadn't even heard that term, that, you know, good luck going to a plant-based restaurant or getting a plant-based meal or caterer or any, you know, any of those things. And now, you know, you, you can't walk into a restaurant without, without there being, um, you know, a little category that says plant-based options. So that's great. Now, 
I think there still needs to be some work because you, as, as you know, AJ, just because something is quote unquote plant-based doesn't make it um, anything that we would consider to be a healthy food, right? If it's full of oil and sugar and kind of processed foods, then, then um, although there might be some plants in there somewhere, it may not be what, you know, what we would necessarily call a healthy plant-based option, but you know, things are definitely shifting and that's, that's really, really great to see. You know, my, my initial kind of entry into the world, you know, you, you asked about is, is that, you know, I was just looking at, at my own life and, you know, I was heavier than I wanted to be and my cholesterol was higher than I wanted it to be. And, you know, I, I scratched my head and kind of asked myself, what's going on here? I mean, I'm, I'm eating a healthy, you know, what, what I thought is a healthy diet, right? You're, you're eating your heart healthy fish and eating your, your heart healthy olive oil and cutting down on red meat and trying to avoid fried foods, right? I mean, all, all the stuff that, that you hear, that you, you'd heard doctors talk about for, for years and years and still hear them, but yet, you know, you're not the weight you wanna be and you're not the cholesterol that you wanna have and all these things. And, and all the patients that I was seeing, right? It seems like everybody's on a cholesterol medication and everyone's on a blood pressure medication and almost everyone's pre-diabetic. And I just kind of asked myself, is this what's in store for me when I'm, when I'm 50 and 60 and you know beyond and so forth. So I actually just independently just started to do reading um, uh, on nutrition. This is before I'd heard of you and had heard of any of the, the vegan mafia. This is before I'd you know heard of uh, the China study and Colin Campbell and kind of all those things. And 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 just on my own, just through just through reading a lot of journal work about nutrition and different kinds of diets. I arrived on a quasi-modified whole food plant-based diet. Um, I was eating a little bit of dairy at the time, but on my own really kind of got to a primarily plant-based diet. And I started doing that. And, you know, and I swim on a swim team. And one of the guys on the, um, on the swim team, I talked to him about the way that I was eating. And he says, you know, wow, it sounds like you're following the engine two diet. And I'm like, the engine two diet, what's that? And um, he said, well, you know, you should, you should go check out this book. And I, I read this book and that, that kind of opened my eyes because that was my first sort of entry into the, into the plant-based um, movement, uh, you know, and, and it really is a movement. And, you know, from that book, I read the China study and um, Forks Over Knives followed it about that time and Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease with Dr. Esselstyn. So that was really kind of the, um, the full awakening. And it was, it, it was incredible. It, you know, it, it just felt like what I'd been looking for for so long. And, had finally discovered. That is great. Didn't you tell me a long time ago that I think you lost about 30 pounds when you went plant-based that some of your colleagues thought you were sick? Yeah, no, I mean, you, you know, concerned colleagues were kind of stopping me in the hallway in the hospital, you know, with a grave look on their face. So, you know, Roy, are, are you okay? Is everything okay? And at, at, at one point, I, I, I have to confess, I, I was losing weight so fast on this diet that, that I actually, you know, started to scare myself. And I was kind of thinking to myself, wow, you know, did I, have, have I become plant-based and developed, you know, cancer simultaneously? And you know, I was even for, for for a minute or two, I was even thinking about, you know, maybe getting, uh, you know, getting some imaging done. But I, you know, calmed down and just kept eating well and kept losing weight, and everything was good. I I, I only know you this size. I'd love to someday see your before picture because it's it's hard to yeah, imagine. That's not happening. That's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> so so many people are are posting in the chat, what do you think of various sleep aids? And I've written down the ones I've seen. Benadryl, medical marijuana, sleeping pills, hydroxyzyme, melatonin, yay or nay? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, super, super common questions, right? Um, you know, I, I think, I think my, my instinctive answer is that nobody is born with a deficiency of any of those molecules, right? Nobody is born with a, you know, deficiency of fill in the blank. Um, so when, when patients come to me for insomnia, and I actually really enjoy talking to people about insomnia because you know in, insomnia is one of those things that, that gives people so much grief and so much stress, it really does. You know, and it's, 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 so, it's so stressful to not sleep well and, and, and to be worried about your sleep and anxious about your sleep. And of course it becomes a vicious cycle because the bedroom, which is supposed to be this warm, safe, kind of inviting place where all of your cures melt away. For somebody with insomnia, just imagine you walk into the bedroom and instead of it being this carefree, uh, lighthearted place, 
it's this place of just oppression where you're where you're just worrying about how long is it going to take for me to sleep tonight and what time am I going to wake up in the morning and how bad is it going to be tonight and how bad is my headache going to be tomorrow morning and you know oh it's 2 a.m and I'm still not asleep and I've got that 7 a.m conference call you know right so I mean it just becomes this place where all these worries um step in and of course that snowballs because the more you're worried and the more you're anxious the harder of course it is to fall asleep so you know i i, I really enjoy talking to people about this about this um this process of, of how to untangle that how to untangle that knot um you know medications are there medications are definitely an option for some people but i would always try to encourage somebody first of all to um, really look carefully at sleep hygiene, sleep hygiene, sleep hygiene, sleep hygiene. And, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing everything right. But, you know, the, the analogy I use is there's, you know, there's grade level sleep hygiene, there's college level sleep hygiene, graduate level sleep hygiene, and there's, you know, postdoc sleep hygiene. And, you know, there's, there's always more things that you can do, always more things that you can learn to be better, whether it's about behaviors that we're doing during the day. Like, for example, we talked about caffeine earlier. I would say somebody who's struggling with, with um, insomnia should be on a zero caffeine diet, including decaf. Um, somebody who's struggling with, with insomnia should be on a zero alcohol diet. Um, you know, you're, you're all about plant-based, right? Um, you know, we, we know studies have looked at diet and its effects on sleep and, you know, no big surprise, right? high sugar, high fat, processed foods, meats are associated with poorer sleep architecture, shorter sleep times, lower quality sleep, plant-based foods, complex carbohydrates, right, are associated with all the good things that, that, that we look for for sleep. So, um, you know, when are you exposing yourself to light? What is the timing of your last meal? Um, have a minimum of three to four hours gone by between the last thing you put in your mouth and, and when you're going to bed, right? So, I mean, there's all these things that people can do. Um, what are you doing to, to um, de-stress, right? I mean, stress is kind of the forgotten sort of aspect of our health, but it's so important. Um, you know, when, when I talk to my patients about general health, it's not just diet, which is obviously super important. It's not just sleep, which is obviously super important, but exercise is super important and stress management is super important. I mean. And in, in, in for me, what, what I emphasize to my patients is those four things. I think if, if you're doing just one out of the four or two or three out of the four, you're not, you're not doing the whole picture. So, you know, when, when I talk to somebody about insomnia, um, are you anxious? Is it, is, are there anxiety provoking things in your life? How is your mood? Are you, you know, are, are you down about something? Is depression possibly an issue that, you know, that, that needs to be addressed? The, one of the mainstays of therapy of treating insomnia is to work with a sleep psychologist via what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy is a specific psychology treatment paradigm that's been very, very well studied and well validated for the management of insomnia. So, you know, people ask me about medications, but I think it's really kind of putting the cart before the horse in many situations, because there are so many other things that people can do um, prior to even having a discussion about medications that are that are so valuable um, and and typically get the job done. Um, you know, I, I think if people did those things, most of the people who need medications or rely on medications probably would be able to come off of them. Um, you know, in, in in my individual practice, when when people come to see me, you know, inquiring about about sleeping medications, sleeping pills, I really encourage them. To, to go through the sleep hygiene process, go through a sleep education process. There's books on insomnia that I recommend that I'm happy to share and maybe we can put in the, um, in the notes below the, uh, below the talk. Um, yeah, which um, ones, did, is one of them by any chance either Circadian Code or Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker? Or is it both, both. I mean, my, my favorite book on sleep is The Circadian Code by Sachin Panda. Um, and I've recommended that book to, I don't even know how many hundreds of patients I've recommended that book to, but it is my absolute favorite book about sleep. And it's a book that I think everyone should read, whether you feel that you have insomnia or not, because there's so much in there just about general health and, and just really understanding that, that, that our body is, 
is uh, there's there's a rhythm and a flow to our body, and when when you, it's it's like if you're trying to swim upstream as opposed to trying to swim with the current, um, you know I, I think that's just kind of the analogy that came to my mind right here in the moment. You know I think if you understand the rhythms of your body and you understand how your body works in that sense and you respect those rhythms, you will be a much happier, healthier person. Right. You know, I like that you mentioned exercise, though, because our ancestors, I don't think even if you did live in the Stone Age, they probably wouldn't need your services because they were they were active all day. Most yeah. people are sitting all day like me. And I, I got to tell you, I'm sure I, I don't know everyone, but every client I've had that has poor sleep, they don't exercise or they do. It's very, very minimal, like like a like a like a stroll. But people that really, you know, move during the day, you're tired by the time you lay down. Yeah. Look, I mean, it's, it's a cohort of activities that seem to flow together that seem to result in good health outcomes, right? So following a healthy diet, a whole food plant-based diet, um, respecting your sleep and, and giving yourself adequate opportunity to sleep and time to sleep and all of that. Um, uh, exercise, we just talked about, super, super important. I start every day with exercise, seven days a week. Um, you have at like 4 a.m. or something, just so you can swim before your, your shift at the hospital? You know, it's so sad. Our our uh, our, our pool, I, I used to swim at, at, uh, at UCLA. Uh, the, the pool has been closed for the past year with the pandemic, so I haven't done much swimming in the past year, but I converted my garage to a pretty nice, pretty nice home gym, and I start... Um, Every day I'm there by you know, five, five thirty, and doing my thing. So that is incredible. Debbie. Great way to start the day. That's incredible. Wow. So here's a here's a question from Monica, who's watching live on YouTube, saying, "What does Dr. Artal think about the saying the hours you sleep before midnight count as double?" Because I remember doing an interview a long time ago with Dr. Linda Carney, who said you got to be in bed by ten because I guess something more important or almost magical happens before midnight that doesn't happen after midnight. Do you know what they're referring to? Um, I, I can't say that I do. Um, there's there's different stages of sleep. Some are more prevalent in the first part of the night. Others are more prevalent in the, in the last third of the night. So, for example, slow wave sleep, um, uh, 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 deep wave, slow wave sleep tends to be more prevalent in the first part of the night. Whereas REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, tends to be most prevalent in the last third of the night. So that's why a lot of the dreaming that you do, a lot of people recognize that they tend to do a lot of their dreaming kind of at the end of the night when they're sort of waking up in the morning. That's because most REM sleep takes place in that kind of last part of the night. Um, uh, but I, I've, I've not heard that specific expression before. No. I'll see if I can find out. I have to watch the, I should have watched that interview with her to see it exactly what it is she said. What about people that have to work at night and sleep in the day? Um, here, let me just turn off this phone here. Sorry about that. It's, it's not ringing. Um, people who have to work at night and sleep during the day, um, it's tough. It's really tough. Um, you know, um, I think I think that it's um, uh, very important to maintain really strict regulation over when you're when you're awake, when you're asleep, when you're exposed to light. Um, you know, unfortunately, though, you know, for, for for people who do that, it's 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 really kind of operating their machinery, operating their biology, contrary to what contrary to the way that we were designed. Um, you know, I think my, my general advice, um, you know, and, and this may not be advice that's, um, it's, it's, a, it's advice that's difficult if, if you have to work at night or if that's the only thing that's available to you. But I, I, I would encourage people, if at all possible, to, to try to shift away from that and, and, to, um, and, and to adopt, uh, to, to find a position or adopt a position where you where you can work and sleep during more kind of traditional blocks of time for, for people who don't have a choice. Uh, yeah, you know, as I said, just meticulous sleep hygiene of regulating when you're eating, when you're going to sleep, when you're waking up. You know, one of the things that people tend to do when they're very tired is they make poor food choices as a way of staying awake. And, you know, I can remember, and I'm, I'm ashamed to admit, you know, recalling when I was in medical school, some of the, um, less than stellar, you know, kind of food choices that I would make to 
be able to stay up an extra few hours to study for an exam or just you know get through finals and and, and all of that stuff. So we know that we we know that people tend to make poor food choices, sugary food choices, et cetera, when 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 they're, when they're trying to stay awake. So really, just be on top of what you're doing. Um, I, th I think it's it's it, it takes a really um, tremendous sense of diligence, I think, to kind of stay on top of it and, and, and to make the choices, to make the right choices. Well, is there a correlation between either poor sleep or lack of sleep and, and weight? Or is it just because like you mentioned, when you're tired, you don't often make the best choice? Yeah, I mean, I mean there, are, there are definitely some of those associations that we've seen, um, you know, people who are, um, people have poor quality sleep tend to be, um, there's a tendency towards higher weight in those folks. Um, you know, certainly we see that there tends to be uh, uh, poor food choices made. Um, you know, again, it's not always clear, is it a chicken, is it an egg, is it a causation, is it an association, right? So association doesn't necessarily prove causation, but, you know, it's, 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 it's a world where we recognize that, that poor sleep tends to be associated with a lot of poor food choices. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's highly likely that there's a bi-directional relationship between the two. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of, of James Nestor. He's a New York Times bestselling author of Breath. He's not a doctor, but he talks a lot about mouth taping. And so, so there was other people too. Patrick, who was on my show, uh, the Butenko method for people like with asthma or sleep apnea. I do it sometimes. And it, it is kind of cool. You do wake up really refreshed. Have you ever tried it? You know, I've, I've not tried it. Um, I, I have to acknowledge that I've not read the book. Um, yeah, I've I've had a number of patients talk to me or ask me about it over the years. So it's it's uh, I'll have to write it down and uh, um, um, add it to my uh, add it to my book pile. But Pat, Patrick, um, you and actually, the, the, yeah, I'll show you. But it just it's kind of interesting. Yeah, because it definitely you can't snore if your mouth is closed. Yeah, you know, um, again, I, I I don't have a comment. I did look it up. Um, I, I did try to do a little bit of a research uh, review on it and see if there's any anything any stuff out there. I couldn't find anything, so I, I really don't have any. Um, you know, and, unfortunately, I don't have anything to kind of add or share beyond that. It's not something that I have any experience with. Okay, I just have to thank Amy for the super chat donation, and the other day Angela gave one, and Becky, and I didn't ring the bell, so thank you guys so much. All right, let's see. If you guys are watching on Facebook, I can't see your comments in the chat, so please watch on YouTube so we can ask the doctor your questions. Here's one from Angela. Short-term sleepers, is that such a thing? Can be as little as four hours a night and long-term sleepers. Do you know that, is there something, a short-term sleeper and a long-term sleeper? Yeah, short short sleepers and long sleepers. So, you know, it it is a thing, you know, people who, who say that they, you know, do great after a short amount of sleep. and and um, uh, you know they they are out there. I think it's it's um, it, it's a um, you know the, the the challenge is is how you sort of reconcile people who regard themselves as short sleepers with kind of emerging studies, emerging data coming out, um, calling into question some of the some of the negative health consequences of being quote unquote a short sleeper. So, for example, just last week in, in the journal Nature, uh, a study came out which got a fair amount of um, press that people who sleep under six hours in their fifties and sixties have have a significantly higher rate of dementia later on in their seventies. Um, so you know it's and, and and there's been studies like that kind of swirling around. Um, you know, again, associations, it's, it's not proven causation, um, but, you know, we're, we're aware of data like that. And I think, I think, um, I think the sleep medicine community is, is trying to sort of make sense of what that means. And, you know, certainly a lot of, a lot of research efforts are being poured into that, but, um, you know, pe people pose to me the question, you know, I sleep less than six hours, I sleep four hours, I sleep five hours. Does that mean that I'm going to get X, Y, or Z you know, later on. And you know, the, the answer is absolutely not. You know, I, I think the first thing that you need to ask yourself is how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? I mean, if, you, if you're a short sleeper, quote unquote, and you sleep four and a half hours, five hours, and you feel great, and you've got great energy during the day, and you've got no other health issues, and you're eating right, and you're exercising, then you know, if, if that's working for your body, then um, 
you know, it's, it's probably okay. But, um, you know, I, I, I think we're, we're, we're still trying to understand um, where these, where these different things fit with it, with, within this puzzle. But, you know, I, I think that the, I, I would be most concerned about the short sleeper who has other chronic medical problems, who's, who's overweight, who's not exercising, who has other kind of chronic medical illnesses. And I would be concerned that the short sleep is just one um, other manifestation of, of poor health. So um, I think something that you should discuss with your doctor, but you know, it's, it's, um, um, yeah. Wow. How, how many hours do you sleep? Do you have a bedtime? I do have, I do have a bedtime. My, my kids usually get in the way of my bedtime, <laughs> but I, I try to be in bed by 9.45, 9.30, And, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm usually up by five. So I get about, you know, about seven, seven and a half hours of sleep per night. Most nights. The only time my sleep is disrupted is when we, we change the clocks. And then I have the hardest time, not when we, uh, not when we fall back, you know, spring forward, that yeah. is the hardest thing. Are there any yeah. tips or tricks that, that, that the couple of weeks after we do that, I'm messed up. Why can't, why can't we just be like Arizona and just keep it one time? Well, I'm with you. I, th I think we should get rid of that stuff altogether, but you know, that, that does lead into one of the most common sort of self-inflicted sleep disorders that are out there, which is called social jet lag. Um, and if you think about it, right, you know, we, we go to bed at a certain hour, most of us work Monday through Friday, and we go to bed at a certain hour Sunday night through Thursday night in order to be able to wake up at a reasonable hour the next work morning and, and, and go off and do our thing. But Friday nights and Saturday nights, we kind of go a little bit, a little bit crazy. We're like, ah, oh, you know, nothing going on, to, nothing going on tomorrow. So we're going to go out late, go to the clubs, go to the movies, go out, you know, do whatever it is that we do. And people will go to bed hours later than their usual time. And Saturday and Sunday morning, they'll tend to also, on top of that, they will also engage in catch-up sleep and wake up hours later than they usually do. So instead of waking up at six or seven, like they might do Monday through Friday to go to work, they're gonna wake up at eight or nine or 10 or sometimes, sometimes even later. So it creates what we call social jet lag. So Sunday evening, when it's time to go to bed and you've, and you've woken up, <clears throat> excuse me, and you've woken up at 10 a.m., your body is not ready to go to bed at, at, the, at your usual bedtime Sunday evening because you haven't been awake long enough and because your circadian rhythm has shifted a little bit. So, you know, I think one piece of advice that I give everybody is to really, to the extent that you can, try to go to bed at the exact same time and wake up at the exact same time seven days a week. If you are going to be out late on a Friday or Saturday night, you know what, then just bite the bullet and try to more or less wake up at the same time Saturday and Sunday mornings too. Maybe a little bit later to give yourself a little bit of a break, but not too much later. What you don't want to do is, is shift your rhythm hours and hours. So you're going to have a hard time going to bed um, Sunday night. All right. I just want, my friend wants to say hello to you. I love your friend. <laughs> I, I wish I could reach into the screen and, and they, she has no trouble sleeping. She can sleep. Through anything. <laughs> you know, I, Dr. Goldhammer always talks about sleep to satiation. So that's just meaning you wake up without an alarm clock, right? Yeah, no, I haven't used an alarm clock in years. So um, uh, don't, don't ask me how it works, but you know, I, I say, you know, wake up tomorrow morning at five forty, and somewhere, somewhere, somehow it happens. So I use it, but I just, it doesn't even work. I mean, you know, I get out, I sleep till I'm, I mean, unless I have to catch a plane or you, something. You, you, well, it works, but just another part of your brain is hitting the snooze button. So that's. Yeah, absolutely. So Dr. Rachel, how do we know if we need to see a sleep doctor? And is it something you can do, or do you have to go first go to your internal medicine doctor for a referral in general? No, no. You, you know, most sleep doctors will see, pay, I mean, it depends on insurance plans and, you know, whatnot, HMO and all those things. But um, um, most sleep doctors are, are happy to see patients who, uh, who, who call the office. A good way to find a reputable sleep doctor is, is to go through what's called the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. So if you find a, a, board cert, a sleep medicine board certified physician, um, and, and you can typically find good people through the American Academy of Sleep Medicine um, is a great way to find a local physician to you. Um, how do you know that you need a sleep doctor? Well, you know, I think like we talked about at, at the beginning, just ask yourself, you know, do, do I sleep well? Am, do, am, am I happy with my sleep? 
Um, is this something that I would improve with my sleep? Do I have good energy during the day? And if the, if the answer to all those is, you know, yeah, I sleep good and I've got good energy, then probably not. But, you know, um, if, if you're sleep deprived, if you're, if you're waking up repeatedly, if you're tired during the day, morning headaches, morning sore throats, um, if you're, uh, if people have noted that you snore loudly, people have noted that you have pauses or interruptions in breathing during your sleep, then those all could signify factors that you might want to speak about with a sleep doctor. What do you think about power naps? Love them. Love them. So, you know, um, a short, so, but emphasis on the power nap, not a long nap. So, you know, I would define a power nap as a 15, 20 minute nap um, taken strategically to um, kind of get you through your afternoon. Um, that's as opposed to the one, two, three hour nap, which is likely to do a few negative things. It's gonna lead to what we call sleep inertia. And sleep inertia is that when you wake up from the nap, instead of being rejuvenated and refreshed, you, there's still the inertia of sleep. So you're just as tired, if not more tired, because now your brain is in sleep mode and it just wants to continue to sleep. Um, so long naps can lead to sleep inertia that we don't like. And long naps also tend to mess up what happens to us at nighttime. So it's okay to take a short nap. Again, a 15, 20 minute nap is probably the sweet spot. Um, as long as it's not interfering with your sleep at nighttime. Yeah. And as long so, as you're not driving while you're doing definitely. it. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, thank you for clarifying. I mean, that's a real thing. I mean, that's, that's what I, you know, one of the reasons I don't like driving at night is because that, I mean, people really do fall asleep while driving. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's a huge, uh, you know, it's, it's a huge public health issue, right? And, you know, a lot of these terrible accidents that we hear about and car accidents, um, so forth are, are, are caused by people falling asleep behind the wheel. Um, no, I you know, and, and, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I just got to say, I mean, if you are tired, pull over, you know, if you, you know, if, if, if you're tired, go get yourself a coffee somewhere, uh, you know, go get yourself a nice tea, you know, go pull over, take a, take a nap for 15, 20 minutes, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very serious public health issue. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Well, that, that's the one time I would say, yeah, definitely get coffee. Don't be on the road. Yeah. yeah. You know, I always wondered, and I, only one time did I volunteer in a prison and I wasn't there at night, but from my understanding, they don't really turn the lights out in prison. So how, how do prisoners ever get adequate sleep when it's so noisy and it's never dark and they can't control the temperature? Look, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of, a lot of places are, I mean, look at hospitals, right? So, you know, just in the last few years, I've seen um, some hospitals make efforts in terms of turning down the lights at nighttime. I mean, what, what a novel idea, right? You know, to actually respect, again, getting back to circadian rhythms and the effects of, the effects of light on our, on our nervous system, right? So, you know, wh whether you're talking about a prison, whether you're talking about you know, hospitals, nursing homes, um, you know, all, all these, all these environments where um, there are people sleeping there and working there and they're functioning 24 hours a day. How do you manage life? Um, you know, so those are, those are really important issues. That's good. Here's a fun question. What's your favorite meal? You're a pretty good chef. As people may not know that when I did a television show, you were on episode 107. You're the one that taught me how to make Brussels sprouts. Oh, I love Brussels sprouts. Um, you know, uh, uh, my favorite meal, you know, I, I don't even know if I have a favorite meal, honestly. You know, I love, I love salads with a bunch of stuff in it and a good tahini dressing. I make a lot of those. I, I, I make tons and tons of bean stews. Of, uh, I make tons of curries, um, lentil curries and um, bean and cauliflower curries and lots of Indian food. My, my pantry is full of Indian spices. Um, yeah, you know, it's uh, oatmeal. I've had the same breakfast every day for the last decade. I have, I have a half cup of oatmeal, a cup of blueberries, a teaspoon of cacao powder, and a tablespoon of ground flaxseed. That's been my breakfast every day for the past decade. Hasn't, oh, you, de ha hasn't deviated once. That is something. Do you, do you bring your lunch to work or is there anything to eat at the Cedars cafeteria? Yeah, yeah I, I bring my lunch to work. I bring my lunch to work. 
That's great. Well, I just enjoyed talking to you so much. I do. I mean, I, I, I'm doing stand up comedy now and I, I have a set coming up uh, doing a show on May 23rd. And one of my jokes is about how much I miss the doctors in L.A. So it's nothing about it. If anything, it's kind of makes fun of the doctors here, which I don't mean to do. But it's just it was just such a great experience having you as our doctor. And I wish there were more just even a plant based, even if it was just one plant based doctor in the whole Coachella Valley, there isn't really. Yeah, I mean, there's one, but he precepts, so he can't really be your doctor. You know, he trains the residents. He happens right. to be plant-based, so he doesn't really, I mean, he said, well, I guess I could see you, but it's not really the same kind of thing. I mean, I could drive 45 minutes to Loma Linda, but it would be just right. so nice if somebody plant-based could could work out here. But, you know, my, my, my thing with that is that you really don't need a plant-based doctor because because the work of being plant-based is work that, that you do at home. Um, I mean, that's the work that you're doing in your kitchen. It's the work that you're doing in, in terms of the choices that you make when you go to the supermarket, the choices that you make when, when you eat out of restaurants. Um, you, know, um, you know, and ideally people do the right thing. They, they, they live their life the right way. And they don't really need to do much with the doctor. Um, you know, most of the people who I see wouldn't, you know, most of the people who I see are there because of, chronic diseases because because of issues related to diet or habits or or, 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 or lifestyle choices right so, so that's why I always kind of emphasize those things right your diet your sleep stress and exercise you know and if people if people do those four things those are the four pillars of health so if people take care of that business they're going to do great have you seen an increase in people with sleep disorders or disruptive sleep since the advent of smartphones? Oh yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy, right? I mean, you can, you know, we, we have our little phone and, 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 and it's, uh, it, it causes nothing but havoc in the bedroom, right? So, um, so many people who I talk to who struggle with, you know, when I see somebody from insomnia, one of the first questions I ask them is, what, what's your bed? What, what's your bedtime routine? Do you take electronics with you into bed? Do you turn the lights off when you get in bed, or or does the phone or the or the tablet come out? And you know, easily eighty percent of the time, the people who I see acknowledge with, with insomnia that is acknowledged that they're spending time on their phone, and they all say the same thing: "I know I shouldn't, but you know." So, um, if you're going to be on your phone, get some blue light blocking glasses. Um, you know, on, on, on evenings where there's some work that I have to do and, you know, I, I try, I really try not to take anything into bed, but sometimes I break my own rule. But if I do, I always put on a pair of blue light blocking glasses. Is it possible to get too much sleep? Is it possible to get too much? Too much sleep. Too much sleep. Um, you know, it, it's been discussed in the past, this so-called U-shaped curve. That, that people who sleep at people who sleep too little or who sleep too much um, have poorer health outcomes than people who are in kind of the, the bottom of the U. Um, I think there, there seems to be more evidence of, of concern related to the short sleepers than, the, than there does for the long sleepers. Um, I think that the jury's still a little bit out on that is my, um, from, from what I've read, but, um, um, my main concern about sleeping too much is just that it interferes with life, that it interferes with social life, family life, you know, work, school, right? So, you know, if, if somebody's requiring, if an adult that is requiring being in bed 10, 12 hours a day, you know, I would, I would, I would suggest that, that, that should be looked into a little bit further about why they're, why they're needing to sleep that much. And is there something going on medically that needs to be addressed? It's not to say that there's a problem, but it just it might just bear a closer look. So, since you've been plant based for quite a while now, since I met you, has made any strides in getting your family to be more plant based? Because they they were kind of some of them were a little bit set in their ways when you started. Yeah, no, we're uh, we're we're pretty much a plant based household. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it it's uh, it's 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 great to see. You know, it's it's great to see, and I I, I hope that it's um. um you know, it's, I, I, I get a, I get such a thrill, such happiness, such satisfaction is what I'm looking for. You know, when, when I, 
interface with somebody and I and and I'm able to convince them to adopt a plant-based lifestyle. You know, I've done that in my family, but you know, so many patients over the years that I've talked to about, hey, you know, you should be, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me what 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 diet do you recommend or you know what way of eating do you recommend, and I tell them, you know, and I I, I tell them I tell them about your books, AJ, and you know, some of, some of our friends' books that they've written and, you know, kind of give them those resources. And it gives me so, so much satisfaction when that same person comes back a year or two later and they just kind of say, oh my God, Dr. Artel, you changed my life. You know, I, you know, I became vegan. I, you know, lost weight. I feel great. I feel so much healthier. I feel like I'm doing the right thing with the environment. I feel like I'm doing the right thing ethically. Um, you know, so it's, um, you know, it, 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 every person we touch, right? they touch somebody else and they touch somebody else. And um, that's how you spread the word. And, you know, again, I mean, I'll, I'll sing your praises every, every chance I get. I mean, you've touched and influenced so many people. I mean, the, the, the work that you do is incredible, so. Well, thank you. I, and, and, you know, it's like you say, each one teach one and thank you for what you do. And I wish you would do it down here because I miss you so much. Well, it's just it's been a pleasure catching up with you. And if you do, I, I know three, Board certifications is a lot when you have to take your boards, but if you ever decide to get a fourth, may I suggest lifestyle medicine? Maybe, uh, you know, maybe at some point I'll move out to the desert. I'll become a, a lifestyle medicine doctor. Oh gosh, it would do so well here, a place like True North, but with food. I think it would be amazing. <laughs> Dr. Clapper lived here for a while, but I, I think, I think, I think we'll do really well here. So thank you so much, Dr. Hartal. Thank you. Pleasure, AJ. All, All right. the best. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time when we will be having a wonderful culinary demo from Dustin Harder, who's known as the vegan roadie. He's going to be making a creamy shiitake and cauliflower risotto. Thanks again, Dr. Artal. Thank you. Bye-bye.